Welcome to Freedom Talk Radio with your host, Andy Peacher. Hi, everyone. Welcome then. It's Andy Peacher for this uh, Thursday, the 21st of March. And tonight we're talking to the author, Steve Snyder. Uh, it's a book about discovering the extraordinary story about Dad Howard Snyder, who was a pilot and the crew of a B-17 on February the 8th, 1944, his plane, the B-17 Susan Roof, was shut down over the French-Belgian border after a mission to bomb Frankfurt in Germany. The book will tell you the story of events leading up to and after that harrowing day of the 10-man crew. Some died, some ended up in prison camps and some ex- evaded capture. What makes this book um, unique is the very detailed and amazing story of what happened to each crew member in particular Howard Snyder, who evaded capture and was missing in action for seven months. It's very important to read the letters, the documents that were exchanged before and after the Susan Booth was shot down, view the photos and follow Steve on his journey to to uncovering these extraordinary World War II events that must never be forgotten. And you can find all that on stevesnyderauthor.com. That's Steve. S N Y D E R author dot com. Welcome to the show, Steve. Third time Thank lucky, you. as we said. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be here. Yeah. Do, do you know what amazes me before we even go into the book? Um, how we take things for granted these days um, when we're flying. You know, the jet liners are so far advanced for passengers. But then we look at these old films and we think, Wow, <laughs> that was just as extraordinary as as that new Airbus 380. You know that little plane that takes two pilots, you know, one with a gun and one to navigate or drive the plane. And wow, you know, it's because the planes never failed. You know, even though they were on bombing missions, unless you got shot down, of course, they never really failed. They were so unique, and this is what captured my sort of uh, imagination when I was looking my wife really loves the World War One and Two films and you know aviation has come on a long way since then oh I'll say yeah back then you had to fly the planes it took a lot of muscle and you know, now that it's uh, with all the computers on the planes they kind of fly themselves yeah fly by um, wire is the nickname for the modern day plane and they can just put it on autopilot you couldn't do it back then, especially flying in those those tight formations that the bombers flew in. Um, it, it was uh, that's why you needed two pilots to fly those planes. Yeah, the co-pilot. My dad was the first pilot, uh, and uh, but the co-pilot flew the plane as much as the first pilot because it was so strenuous, both mental, uh, mentally and physically, to fly those planes. It used to like trade off maybe every every 15 minutes. Yeah, I know, a couple, I know a couple of people, and one in particular from Luton in Bedfordshire. You mentioned Bedford earlier on, um, before we came on air, and you can tell people about that later. But um, yeah, this guy from Luton, he's, he's not so much, I suppose, he's not old enough to have flown these old planes, but he actually, he, he exhibitions these old planes in Stansford, Stansford Airport area, there's um, a big sort of place where they have the the old planes, and he actually goes up in the sky with them and flies them and does displays, that's it. He does the triple loops and all, whatever you want to do with them. And, you know, during the day, he actually flies um, a low-cost carrier airline, EasyJet, we call it, from Luton around, you know, Scotland and Europe. But he does that as a hobby, I mean... Everybody's fascinated with the, the, you know, the airplanes, and I, I must admit I'm into trains myself, <laughs> but because I, I like being on terra firma. But yeah, the airplanes fascinate loads of people. That's the yeah, it's, uh, it's fortunate here in uh, the United States. There's uh, hundreds of warbirds still flying. And there's air shows uh, all across the United States. I go to a lot of them uh, signing copies of my book. But uh, there's uh, 
you can see warbirds fly uh, at the air shows uh, all throughout, pretty much all throughout the year in the United States. And like you say, you know, there's a lot of guys who are either commercial pilots uh, who in their off time, you know, fly these B-17s or uh, fighter planes uh, or what have you. So it's, uh, it, it's really nice that we have that opportunity in almost every state to go see air shows and see all these uh, old, old warbirds fly. Yeah, and of course, there's a, a worldwide um, meetup with with most people that have been in the wars, and you know we've had loads of wars since, and maybe loads of wars before, you know, that we don't know of, and it seems to be World War One and Two seems to be the the two unique wars that no one will ever forget. Well, they were the two world wars, so and that's probably why. Yeah, much bigger than anything else. You know, now all the the wars or conflicts or whatever you want to call them are all very localized. And, you know, more terrorist actions or guerrilla actions as opposed to uh, world wars. You know, uh, World War One, the Great War, was supposed to end all wars, but that did not. And uh, the World War Two, there was no other event uh, in history that affected more people than World War II. Virtually, uh, it, it affected every, every every nation and every every continent uh, was involved uh, in World War II. No one escaped the uh, the horror of it. Now, I, I think one of the horrors I can think of, um, and before I do that, we'll mention the book. Of course, it's called Shot Down, and we'll go into that a little bit in a minute, but one of the horrors that, even though I wasn't probably old enough. No, I wasn't even born, was I? What am I talking about? <laughs> but but when my mum um, was telling me about the war, because uh, she was born in 1932 or three, Yeah, so she would have been like a teenage girl. And she was telling us about the, the coupons and all that. But I think one thing that brought me, and even though I wasn't there to remember the war, is actually not not what they call it Nazi Germany or Hitler's Germany that was so cruel to people and okay you know we probably won in the end but that's not the point it's it's a scar that's kind of left there it's not just a normal fight you know two people having a fight or thousands of people having a fight and you won okay shake hands goodbye don't do it again it's one of them that's ingrained in your mind you know and there's even people even today in groups of anti-Nazism and, you know, I know it's not the same thing, but they did have planes and they did have <laughs> lieutenants. They were shooting people because they were part of the war. And But the the kind of trauma that that, that brought, you know, and we'll always remember World War Two for that. Um, well, we were over here in Europe. Well, yeah, the uh, Nazi Germany, they had a pretty efficient killing, killing machine. Um, there, there were about 60 to 65 million people who were killed during War II, and 75% of them were civilians. And then millions more were wounded, millions more were left homeless and displaced. So as I mentioned, you know, it, uh, it was a tremendous uh, and horrendous event. Yes, so silly question <laughs> it probably is um what i'm thinking who shot down your, your dad howard then over belgium uh well, well my dad's b-17 was attacked by two uh german uh Falk wolf 190 fighters and uh in the ensuing air battle uh the, the susan ruth uh, his plane which was named after my oldest sister who was one year old at the time that he went overseas, um, was shot down. Although both those German uh, planes were shot down as well. One was piloted by Siegfried Merrick, and his plane crashed and he was killed. And the other was piloted by Hans Berger, who was able to bail out and he made it through the war. And uh, that's an interesting story in itself. Yeah, imagine them. Um... It's, I mean, it's good sometimes to know the enemy, um, especially afterwards, because 
I think now they treat it because I've seen it on TV, even though like like English groups will go to France, Belgium, they will allow in some of these meetups, they'll allow that, you know, even the German um, people are that, that may still be alive to come to these groups, even though they were the enemy at the time. And I think that's very humble uh, of people sort of forgetting yeah. the past. Yeah, I, uh, this last uh, winter I spoke at a, a, a military history group in uh, the state of Michigan, and one of their members uh, was a German uh, serviceman. He started off in the Luftwaffe, but then he was transferred to the, the military, and then he ended up uh, actually being a guard at a uh, POW camp. So he had quite an interesting story. So yeah, I do run into uh, uh, not too many, uh, but you know some uh, men that served in uh, the German military, or I actually run into a few more people who were you know young uh, or children or young people during the war and uh, went through those horrific bombings that uh, the British and the American and did, you know, especially on the, you know the most. Uh, Notorious are uh, Hamburg, uh, Dresden, and uh, uh, Cologne, and Berlin, where thousands of uh, German civilians died in those those bombings. Yeah, it's all these documents that you've got on your website um, in the book as well. You know, like Howard's um, Class A pass for the 41st Division, Fort Lewis. Because I, I think this is what makes this book a, a lot more interesting than just a a book, you know, because there's pictures and documents and, you know, you don't often see the original pictures and documents in these books. So they're always, I won't say they're taken from anywhere in particular, but they're just, they're put there as examples rather than the originals. And, you know, I think this is brilliant the way... You, you've done this. Well, thank you. Yeah, there's over 200 uh, time period photographs and maps and documents that are in the book so you can visualize everything that you're reading about. My dad had kept uh, all his uh, orders and military documents, so that was really nice. Uh, in fact, uh, really, there were, my parents kept a lot of uh, information material from the, the war years. There were two items that were most significant. Uh, one was a diary he wrote uh, my, that my dad wrote while he was missing in action after his plane was shot down, uh, and it recounted uh, how the plane was attacked and shot down by the German fighters, and it's absolutely riveting, and uh, that's included in the book. And uh, the other item that was really significant are all the letters that my dad had written to my mother during the war, which are absolutely fascinating. He was very candid in his uh, letters that he wrote to my mother. He wrote about what bombing missions were like, what, wrote what life was like on the base at Thurlai uh, near Bedford. He wrote what life was like in England and London at the time, uh, escapades of uh, him and his crew, and lots of excerpts from those letters are included uh, in, the, in the book. So I was really fortunate to have uh, all that material at uh, my disposal. My disposal. Yeah, and I, I noticed that he, you know, like you said, you wrote to um, your mum, uh, Ruth, and it's just amazing how, you know, um, <laughs> if you think about it, you know, I'm going out in the morning, I'm just going to shoot a few planes down, and, you know, to, before I go, I've got to write to, to the wife to let her know how things are going, just to reassure her that I'm okay. I mean, he obviously was a deeply loved family man because of you know all that well back then you know the only way to communicate was uh through uh, written letters uh, you know, they couldn't telephone or there's no email or uh, uh instagram or <laughs> or and any, any no technology like that and uh so people they wrote a lot back then and really that was the uh the highlight of any day for 
servicemen or for their loved ones back home is to receive a letter. Uh, if you're a superman, serviceman, either no news from home or if you were you know, a family member back uh, home, to find out uh, what your loved one was going through. And uh, that was a huge day. But the, the mail was pretty sporadic. Uh, my, you know, sometimes they wouldn't receive any letters for several days or and then some days they'd receive a bunch of letters all at once. But that was certainly the highlight uh, of any day uh, when they had mail call and uh, got a letter from their loved ones. Uh, a B-17 had a 10-man crew. Uh, uh, three of the, the my dad's crew were married. My father, uh, the flight engineer, or she's and uh, excuse me, the my dad, the co-pilot, and the uh, the bombardier. But my dad was the only one who had a child. I, and that's why they named the plane after uh, uh, my dad's daughter, my sister Susan Ruth. As you mentioned, my mother's name was Ruth. Well, yeah, I was reading one of the. Trans, uh, telegrams from uh, you know the War Department to to Ruth, and it and it says um, the Secretary of War desires you know me to express his deep regret that your husband, First Lieutenant Howard uh, J Schneider, has been reported missing in action since the 8th of February over France. Now that were dated um, uh, February 23rd. That's it, and then. What made me what made me um, really really thinking they knew what they were doing in them days um, because these days and I'll explain my point these days you you get a letter or you get a phone call sorry but blah blah blah's missing can't tell you anymore we don't know anymore um, you know two two days three days a week two weeks go by and you're still worrying and wondering but no not in the war office. They send a follow-up letter to explain, you know, why uh, he may be missing. What does this mean? You know, the terms missing means, inaction means, it's only usually to indicate we don't know where he is, basically, which, which is very good because, to me, that's a reassuring letter. And I, and I think that's amazing in them days. Now you don't get as much courtesy from anyone. Yeah, they even said in the follow-up letter that, uh, you know, it's possible that, he could be a prisoner of war because oftentimes, you know, if, when planes are shot down, men bail out and they're taken prisoner. So, you know, that kind of gives the family members a little bit of hope uh, as well. But those two communications from the War Department were the only uh, ones my mother got. And during that entire seven months that my dad was missing in action, uh, my uh, other sister uh, was born while my dad was missing action. So that was really tough on my mother because here she's uh, at, at home in California with a one-year-old baby girl, Susan Ruth, and then a little infant girl, Nancy, and she didn't know if she'd ever see her uh, uh, husband again. It wasn't until he finally got back to uh, England and sent her a telegram that she found out that he was still alive and in one piece. Wow, that must have been amazing. Um how long since he obviously was found and he let everybody know he was alive and well, how long did he have, you know, for the rest of his days with your mum or your family? Oh, I mean, how long were they married and when did he no, die? How, how long did he um, yeah, have before he died after being found, you know? Oh, my uh, my parents had, were both, yeah, they... Uh, had a long, happy marriage. They were married for 65 years. Wow. Uh, my dad wasn't the last crew member to die, but he was the oldest at 91. He died in 2007. Unfortunately, I didn't decide to write the book till 2012, so he uh, didn't live long enough to know anything about it, which is unfortunate. No, but the good thing is, you know, he, he did his duty to his country, and then, you know, God knows how he got from A to B, you know, being bombed and, and lost your plane, nearly lost your life. Uh, how did he manage to get to England to raise the alarm? Uh, well, after his plane was shot down on February 8th, uh, well, let me go a step back. Uh, when the plane was attacked by the German Focke-Wolf fighters, uh, two of the crew were killed in the plane. 
uh, from the 20 millimeter uh, cannon fire from the Bach Wolves. Uh, the other eight crewmen were able to bail out. Uh, when my, after my dad bailed out, he came down in southern Belgium, just, just north of the French border in a little village called Mackenois. And he, is, he came down on a, a group of trees and his uh, parachute got hung up and he was dangling 20 feet off the ground and he couldn't get down. But fortunately for him, a couple of young Belgian men uh, saw him coming down and came to his rescue before the Germans could get to him. Uh, they went back to the farmhouse, got a ladder and a, a rope, and helped him uh, down the tree. And this occurred about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. It was still daylight, so they thought it was too dangerous to move him during the day, so they told him to stay put and hide until nighttime, and they'd come back and get him, uh, which they did. And they took him to the farmhouse uh, of one of these two uh, Belgian gentlemen. Raymond Durvan is his name and his family. And uh, he stayed there one night, but uh, they thought it was too dangerous for him to stay there any longer than that with those German patrols combing the area. So that night, a, a Belgium customs officer named Paul Til Tilken came and got him on a, a tandem bicycle and moved him to another location. It's interesting, uh, when he got him that night, it was uh, pitch black, raining, uh, and they took off. And my dad could only pedal with one leg because he had shrapnel wounds. Uh, in the other leg, and they came to a hill, and they couldn't pedal up it anymore, so they started pushing the bike up to the top of the hill. And when they got there, there was a little cabaret or cafe, and the lights were on. Uh, there was loud uh, music playing, uh, talking, laughter, and all of a sudden, two German officers come out with young girl, their arms around young girls, come up to my dad and Paul, and uh, one of the officers puts his arm around my dad and asks him for a light for a cigarette. <laughs> well, my dad was pretty petrified at that time. He couldn't speak uh, French or German at that time, but Paul was able to uh, light the German officer's cigarette, and they let him go on their way. My dad said they were too drunk and too interested in these young girls to pay much attention to a couple guys pushing the bike up uh, at night in the rain. And after that, he was uh, taken from place to place. Uh, how long he stayed in any house uh, depended on how brave the Belgian people were who stayed there and how dangerous the Belgium underground thought it, it was for him to stay there. He might stay one night. He might spend six weeks. Uh, it all depended. And uh, became good friends uh, with some of those people who he stayed with for lengthy periods of time, and he kept in touch with uh, after the war, and they were unbelievably brave people. They risked their lives and those of their families, aiding down airmen. If the German secret police, the Gestapo, found out about it, uh, they would be uh, arrested, uh, tortured, and either shot or sent to a concentration camp. And some of the Belgian people who helped my dad and his crew did meet that fate. Uh, finally, after a few months, my dad got tired of hiding. Um, it was very stressful for him. Uh, after all, he was he had to bail out of a, his plane that was on fire, comes down in a foreign country, has no idea where he is, doesn't know what happened to his buddies on the crew, can't communicate with the Belgian military. And here he's being helped by people that are total strangers. Uh, they can't speak the language to begin with. And any one of these people might be a Belgium collaborator and turn him over to this Gestapo. And there's several instances described in the book where he was almost discovered in, uh, by the Gestapo. But uh, word came that the Allies had landed uh, on, at Normandy on June 6th, and so he decided to get back into the fight. So he joined up with the uh, French resistance, the Mackie, and started fighting against the Germans, sabotaging German convoys. And he did that for uh, a couple months until finally Patton's Third Army came up through France after, uh, after D-Day, and he met up with them, and then he was able to get back to England. So it was quite an adventure. But as you mentioned, the book's just not about, just not about my dad, but it's about what happened to each member of the crew, because something different happened to each guy. Five of them made it back home, but five of them did not. Yeah, I mean, what an amazing book. And you've only got to look at all the reviews on the website and can't believe uh, 
yeah, I can't believe the industry reviews. Well, I can because, you know, I'm reading it now. But a lot of the books that are sold, I know many authors, in fact, two of them in Canada are my best friends. Known them all my life, nearly. And, you know, they struggle to sell a few books. Um, but more importantly, because... Some authors, they don't do it for the money, they do it for the, the story. Some authors struggle to actually, you know, get the point across or the, the story across, which is normally based on true events. Um, that's for people I know anyway. But, you know, you've had amazing reviews and you've won some awards for the book. I mean, is this the first book you, you, you wrote then? Yeah. Um, wow. It's won, <laughs> it's won close to 30 book awards and... Uh, I had no uh, uh, writing background or training at all. I had a 40-year career in uh, sales and sales management, but I always kind of liked to write. And uh, uh, like you say, the book's done uh, very well, but the story is absolutely uh, in incredible. It's all based on firsthand testimony by the people who were involved in the events that took place. What I added was just, uh, well, actually a great deal of historical information and uh, anecdotes about and surrounding the war to put it in context and uh, give it background. There's an a awfully lot of detail in, that, in, in the book. It's really kind of two books in one. It's the story of my dad and his crew and all those courageous Belgian people. But it's all, also really history about the air war over Europe and about the 8th Air Force who was stationed in, in England during World War II. I probably wouldn't have written the book, though, if it hadn't have been for two Belgium gentlemen, uh, Dr. Paul Delahaye and Jacques Lalo. They were young boys during the war, and they were greatly affected by it. They saw firsthand uh, the atrocities committed against their family and friends. And later on in life, they became local historians, and they interviewed uh, Belgian people and members of the underground uh, who were involved uh, in events uh, involving my dad and his crew and they documented their, their testimony and they provided me with unbelievably detailed information about events that took place over 70 years ago that would have been lost forever without their dedicated research. So I owe them a great debt. Uh, Dr. Delahaye is not uh, with us anymore. He died in 2013. But uh, Jacques Lalo uh, is uh He's in his early 80s, and he's a dear friend of mine. So I really owe them a great debt. And a lot of those pictures I mentioned uh, were taken in Belgium by Belgians in 1944, some amazing pictures that were taken uh, so many, many years ago. It must be heart-wrenching to talk about this sometimes. I know you're probably, you know, being an author and being a, uh, you know, you've had loads of interviews, but... It must still, you know, get, well, not get to you, but, you know, a little thing in the back of your throat, uh, because this man was amazing, and the people he would work with obviously were amazing. And we, we watch on TV, don't we, these war films, and, yeah, there's a few lucky ones that, that live. But a lot of people do die, you know, trying to save the population. And if it wasn't for their... You know, heroism, you know, there wouldn't be, um, I was going to say there wouldn't be no worth living, but the, I try to think of the word. Well, you know, if, 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 the, if yeah, we could uh, all be speaking German now or maybe even Russian, <laughs> if, uh, if the, the, the Allies had not won the won the war, and it was it was touch and go. A lot of people today, even especially younger people, think, well, you know, the, well, probably a lot of young people don't even know who won World War II, for that matter. But they think, you know, it was a cakewalk. But in the early years of the war, the war the war started you know, September first of thirty nine. And, you know, into almost to the end of uh, 42, it was still up in the air who was going to win the war. Uh, the, the, the Axis powers, uh, uh, Germany and Japan and uh, Italy or the, the Allies. It wasn't until late in 41, really, you know, maybe the beginning of 42, where the tide turned 
and then it was inevitable that the Allies were going to win. But in the early years, it was there was very much in doubt. Well, for people who don't understand the war, and to be honest with you, I don't understand it totally. Um, so it was a world war, but there must have, there must have been certain countries against certain countries. So, or was it just the world against Germany? How did it sort of span out? You know, how, was the whole world fighting Germany, or was the whole world fighting, for instance, Germany, Russia, China, as an example? Well, it was you know pretty close to the whole world. Uh, uh, ended up fighting against uh, the Axis powers. Uh, Hitler made some big mistakes uh, along the way that affected the outcome uh, greatly. You know, uh, declaring war on the U.S., for example, right after Pearl Harbor, that was a dumb thing to do on his part because the U.S. just would have concentrated on fighting Japan if he hadn't have done that. Um, but uh, Germany did have some uh, other smaller allies. You know, they uh, allied with Finland for a while and uh, Hungary for a while, uh, Romania, but it was pretty much uh, the world against the Axis powers. Now, I think back then, if I remember, the world population was about 2 million, and they, they, most of the world uh, was fighting against them. Yeah, you know, the, well, the UK, the British Empire was huge back there. You know, before all the uh, the Commonwealth, you know, kind of was separated off, and all those countries got their independence. So just fighting the uh, British Empire was uh, was something. But then bringing in the might of uh, the U.S. industrial uh, capability was was the the, the kicker. Wow. I just Googled it a little bit, and apparently on the 1st of September 1939, German basically invaded Poland, but they was teasing them for the the time before that, where they staged several false flag border incidents to initiate an attack. And, and then the Battle of um, Westerplatz is often described as first battle of the war, and then obviously UK got involved, and then the rest of the world, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, U.S. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that uh, England and France declared war on Germany because they uh, invaded Poland. They wanted to protect Poland's independence. But then when the war ended, uh, the Allies just gave Poland to Russia. So they weren't any, any better off uh, with the Russians as they were with the Nazis. Uh, so the poor Polish people. And actually, uh, Poland, uh, as, uh, along with Yugoslavia, as a percentage of the population, lost a higher percentage of their population than in any other country. You know, not in terms of total number killed, but uh, as a percentage of the population. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I'll just try a picture of one little country, well, Germany is a big country and a few people helping helping them try to take on the world. I mean, like you said, there was a few mistakes, but that would have been very sad if Germany had actually won that one, if you think about it. If, if the whole world was against them and they was doing a good, you know, I watch all these movies and, you know, well, because the wife loves them. And most of the time, the Germans are winning all the time, apart from a couple of operations I, I think one of them was, is it the, the Dam Busters, where they blew the dams up? Another film had, you know, the the English or the Europeans blowing up the bridges. I mean, it was because of that, um, from the TV anyway, it is what made Germany lose the war because they, they couldn't get near, near you anymore. You know, yeah, um, we've done their shore invasions as well, didn't we? We did that to, to get rid of them. They also, the uh, the Allies had a better uh, story to tell other countries because here you have uh, Great Britain and the United States being, uh, you know, democratic countries. So if the Allies won the war, 
you know, all these other countries would be a lot better off than if the Axis powers, which were dictatorships and uh, to totalitarian uh, dictatorships, had won the war. You know, they would have suppressed all these other people and all these other countries. So these other countries would, be, would have been or were better off uh, siding with the Allies than with the Axis powers. As they, the Axis powers, Germany and Japan, were so uh, vicious and savage. I, it, from the time that uh, I started my research to the time the book was published was uh, four and a half years. And uh, so I learned a lot during that time, but I continue uh, to be a kind of a student of uh, World War II history and learn more and more and more uh, pretty, pretty much every single day. Um, yeah. World, an, World War II has always fascinated me. Yeah, there is an interesting author that, that I know. Um, unfortunately, he's going through some bad times at the moment, but his historical um, work on the Napoleon era, I know that's probably way before this, but uh, Peter Hoshra, he was a German, so he is German, stroke British. He's born in London, but lived in Germany most of his life. And he does a lot of history um, in his books. He did focus on the Napoleon Wars, but also um, I think he's done something about World War One and Two as well. You know, if you Google him, I mean, there is a... A big campaign to um, help him at the moment, but you know, all he did was is rewrite history into the truth, and then he was targeted and uh, you know because he, he brought out hundreds of books about it, especially about the German invasions. Um, but anyway, yeah, Peter Hoshrower, he's, he's a he's a good person to me, and um, sadly, you know, powers to be when you. Try and rewrite history, <laughs> you know, in a book. They try and keep you quiet. Hmm. So, out of all the um, people then in this plane, did you say there's only one one person now alive, or was that in no. the whole mission? Well, two of them were killed in, in the plane. The other eight crew members bailed out. But then three of them were kill, killed on the ground a couple of months later. So five of them made it back home. Five of them did not. And is only, do you say there's one alive now or not? No, uh, no. The last crew member died in 2010. Wow. So the, all the, the crew is gone, although Hans Berger, the, the German Luftwaffe pilot, is still living. He's, he's 95 years old uh, today. And... Mm -hmm. uh, that's an amazing story. Uh, when I was doing my research, it didn't even dawn on me to try to find uh, the pilot that shot down my dad's plane. I thought it would be absolutely impossible. Um, most likely he was probably killed in the war or 70 years later he died since then and I can't speak German. Uh, but one day my, when I was doing my research, my wife casually asked, well, why don't you try to find the German pilot that shot down your dad's plane? Like, it was no big deal. And I thought, well, she doesn't know what she's talking about. You know, she's, she's crazy. But like a good husband, I did what she told me to do, and I found Hans Berger. And fortunately for me, he speaks English. And uh, he gave me some wonderful insight that's in the book about what it was like to go up against the 8th Air Force. And um, we become friends. So like I said, he's 95 years old. Uh, now he lives in Munich, Germany. For the book, I interviewed him over the telephone and uh, through email. But uh, after the book was written, I went to Munich and uh, met with him in person and filmed an interview with him, wow. which, which was pretty amazing to be with the uh, – the man who shot down my dad's plane, although the gunners on my dad's plane shot Hans Berger's plane down. So actually, they shot each other down. <laughs> Is it, isn't that amazing? You couldn't make this story up, could you? Um, no. It's, it's Welcome, Welcome to Freedom, Freedom Talk, Talk Radio. Radio. We're your host, Andy, Andy Peacher. Peacher. Yeah, welcome back. Um, 
just had a little break there. We're talking to the author, Steve Snyder. Shot Down is the book. Um, it's available on goodreads.com forward slash shot down. And you can also find it on the website um, as well, which is Steve Snyder author.com. Now, Steve, S N Y D E R author.com. Um, Steve, welcome back. Um, I probably should have started on the other part of this at the beginning is why did you um, and how did you write the book? Sure. Um, Well, I retired from my uh, career job in uh, 2009 and that's when I had the time to really delve into my dad's war history in in more detail. Growing up, I knew the basics of my dad's World War II history. I knew he was a B-17 pilot. He was stationed in the 8th Air Force, uh, in England with the 8th Air Force. He was playing his name to Susan Ruth after my oldest sister, and he flew bombing missions over occupied Europe and Germany. And then he was shot down on February 8th of 44. was missing in action for seven months, but uh, evaded capture and made it back to the U.S. But uh, and like most World War II veterans, my dad didn't talk a lot about the war until 1989, a memorial was built to my dad and his crew in the little village of Mackinwas where the plane came down. And he and the other three crew members that were still living at the time went over for the dedication. And there he was reunited with all these Belgian people that hit him during the war and saw homes where he stayed in. And that brought it all back, and he started talking about it uh, after that. And then my first visit to Belgium was in 1994 with my parents. And that's when it became personal uh, for me. But after I retired, I I had uh, time to uh, really delve into it. And, uh, you know, going through all the material that uh, my parents had kept, uh, my dad's diary, those letters, et cetera, it just became my passion. And I started reading book after book about the air war over Europe. I went on the Internet and spent countless, countless hours doing research, downloading uh, declassified military documents, uh, mission reports, uh, group diaries, uh, squad squadron diaries, etc., war crimes reports. I joined a number of World War II organizations, started going to reunions, listening to veterans tell their stories, and finally, uh, three years uh, into it, I just came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that it needed to be told. People needed to read about it, and so I decided to write a book. Uh, from the time I started my research to the time the book was published for four, was four and a half years. Uh, it took me about a, 12 months to actually write the manuscript. And then uh, I formed my own publishing company uh, to, uh, to publish the book called Seabreeze Publishing, a one-person limited liability company. Uh, Seabreeze Drive is the name of the street that I live on in Seal Beach, California. So that's where I got the name. And then I contracted with independent professionals for all the associated services, such as uh, editing, cover design, interior layout, printing the book, uh, fulfillment, and et cetera. And it was uh, actually published uh, in August of uh, 2014. And it's now available as both a hardcover book, soft cover book, uh, paperback, uh, in all ebook formats, and it's also available as a, an audio book. And uh, the first half of the book kind of builds up to the day the plane was shot down, and then the second half of the book is all about uh, what happened uh, afterwards. As I mentioned, it's just not about my dad, but it's about each member uh, of the crew. And since I wrote the book, it's it's basically changed my life. Uh, you know, after I retired, I was you know just taking it easy as a retiree, sleeping in and taking naps and reading books, going for walks. And now that since I wrote the book, I basically am working full time again, promoting the book. I do a lot of speaking, going to all sorts of organizations, doing PowerPoint presentations. Uh, as I mentioned, I go to air shows all around the United States, uh, signing copies of my books, spend hours each day on social media. So it's really become a new uh, location for me, but it's something I'm passionate about and uh, I love. I get to meet lots of wonderful people uh, every place I go. I'm fortunate to uh, meet a lot of World War II veterans, especially 8th Air Force veterans here in the U.S. 
um, learn some of the more of their stories. So it's been very uh, gratifying and uh, fulfilling uh, writing the book. Yeah, it's it's just a shame that you know if you'd wrote that book ten years earlier, maybe Dad could have joined you on them travels and met some of the colleagues that you met, which you can't change history, of course, but at least, um, you know, any surviving family members or crew or people that knew people that knew people, you know, within large circles of the families, you know, obviously they're getting the benefit of your book, which is absolutely brilliant. And we will, I will ask you... Um, about the bombing mission soon, but I think this sums this up a little bit. I found an article uh, from War History Online, and it's a review of the book, basically saying, you know, he got so much more from this book. You know, he said he's read hundreds of these books, but this one was the only one that stood out. And he said the experience of the B-17 Susan Roof and its crew is totally squarely, sorry, told squarely, with the larger framework of the war, the Nazi aggression in Europe, the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor, and the push of General Peyton's Third Army into Germany are highlighted, um, providing a family backdrop to the unique episode of Lieutenant Howard Schneider and his crew. Author Steve Schneider's grasp of history is solid and readily apparent. And th this is unique to any book, and you sorry, not unique, this is unique to your book. You don't get this often in a book, and it carries on saying, the beginning of the book focuses obviously on the training the crew received and life at bases um, such as Furley in England, uh, which is, by the way, near, near Bedford. And I didn't realise that. That wasn't a million miles away from where my mum was brought up in St. Neots, I think, which is just... 10, 20 miles away, um, by highlighting recreational activities, living conditions in Nissan huts, and interactions with the English villagers. Readers gain insight into the cultural bummer cruise experience. Not surprisingly, the local pub was a key attraction. Um, it's a place where you talk in it and have a beer. Um, and, and another early chapter describes in detail the crew positions and the role of each member aboard. aboard sorry. For example, in the event of an enemy fighter attack, and we're going to talk about the bombing missions in a minute, the flight engineer typically manned the top turret, twin 50 caliber guns, gun placements, technology such as the northern bomb site tactics, and flying formations are also addressed. Uh, I won't read the rest of it, but yeah, let's go into a bit about uh, the, the bombing then. I mean, I said to you jo jokingly um, earlier, if you're trained to do a job, surely it's like a walk in the park. You just get on your plane, you start bombing, fighting, and you go back to, back back into your wherever, you know, back to the um, the place you live, and you do more training. You go and bombing again, but I mean that was really sort of an off <laughs> uh, chat. I get it. Guess from the films I've read, seen anyway in in the wars, every single even the confident fighters, they always know this could be the last trip. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Flying combat missions, uh, whether you were in the 8th Air Force or RAF, uh, was extremely dangerous and, and, and brutal. And uh, in, the, in the 8th Air Force, 26,000 men died. That's more than an entire U.S. Marine Corps fighting in the Pacific. Another 28,000 men became prisoners of war after their planes were knocked out of the sky by either German fighters or German uh, anti-aircraft fire. Being a combat crewman in the 8th Air Force during World War II was the most dangerous duty assignment in the United States military during that time. And it was dangerous from the time they uh, took off from the time they landed uh, to begin with, there were about 40 bomb groups uh, at its peak in the 8th Air Force stationed in, in and around East Anglia, you know, which is about the size of uh, Vermont uh, here in the, in the U.S. 
And these bases were located only about five to 10 miles apart. So on the day of a mission, you had hundreds of these planes taken off all at the same time. And back then there wasn't any air traffic control or, or radar. Everything was based on visual sight. And usually the, the weather, the English weather was pretty, uh, pretty poor. Uh, visibility was low, it was socked in with, with fog. And you couldn't see anything until you about, it got above the cloud layer. So mid-air collisions uh, were not uncommon. And then these uh, bombers had to form up. Uh, individual planes formed up into three plane elements. Elements formed up into squadrons. Squadrons formed up into bomb groups. Bomb groups formed up into combat wings. Combat wings formed up into air divisions. And all this took an hour to two hours before they could even head across the English Channel uh, to begin their mission. And then they had to deal with the elements. Uh, the planes weren't pressurized, so above 10,000 feet they had to go on oxygen or else they'd pass out uh, quickly and they could die in a few minutes. There was also a freezing cold that was minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero at the altitude that these bombers were flying. So frostbite was a huge problem. And many uh, airmen were hospitalized uh, for lengthy periods of time with serious frostbite wounds. Uh, one of my dad's waste butter gunners, John's Pindrock, was uh, hospitalized for over two months uh, because of his frostbite uh, injuries. And then they had to deal with uh, enemy fighters. Uh, the Germans had radar stations uh, along the continental coast of Europe, so they knew when these bomber formations were coming, and they'd send up the, their air force, the Luftwaffe, uh, to attack them. And at the beginning of the uh, bombing campaign, it was 8th Bomber Command's belief that these uh, uh, B-17s and B-24 bombers could defend themselves from the German Luftwaffe because they were heavily armed with 12 to 13 uh, 50 caliber machine guns so they could put out a lot of firepower. So with all that uh, firepower flying with hundreds of bombers and tight formations, they thought they, they didn't need any es uh, fighter escort. But that soon proved to be not the case. Uh, in the early uh, years of the war, 1942, particularly in 1943, uh, the Eighth Air Force took devastating losses. Uh, even though they implemented a, a mission limit of 25, then you could go home if you met that, it was statistically impossible to complete 25 missions in 1943. The average number of missions flown by a, a crew was about six before they got shot down. And then when they started to give uh, the formations fighter support, uh, the fighters couldn't uh, adequately uh, escort the bombers all the way uh, into Germany, to targets into Germany. They could escort the bombers across the channel into continental Europe, but then they'd run low on fuel and they'd have to head back to their bases in England where the German Luftwaffe would just wait until the the fighter support would turn around and head back uh, to England, then they'd swoop in for the kill. And the losses culminated in uh, the fall, actually October of 1943, in what was termed as Black Week, when over a four-mission period, the uh, 8th Air Force lost 148 bombers. That's almost 1,500 men lost. The worst day was nicknamed uh, Black Thursday, uh, October 13th. Uh, on a raid to Schweinfurt, Germany, when the 8th Air Force put up 291 uh, B-17s and 60 of them were shot down. That's, again, 600 men lost. Uh, and after Black Week, uh, the 8th Air Force was uh, pretty much in shock. Uh, they seriously uh, uh, considered discontinuing daylight bombing because there was no way they could, they could sustain those losses. It wasn't until right at the end of uh, 43, the beginning of 44, actually, when uh, drop tanks, external fuel tanks, were added to the uh, P-47 Thunderbolts and the introduction of the P-51 Mustang that these fighter form or bomber formations finally had adequate support that could uh, take them all the way deep into Germany to the target and escort them back uh, home to their base. Uh, the P-51s were particularly effective. They basically wiped out the Luftwaffe in the spring of uh, 43. By the time D-Day came around, there was uh, nearly a, a 
German fire to be seen in the sky over the uh, Normandy beaches. Uh, Dwight I uh, General Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower, said to the troops that uh, they didn't need to worry. If they saw a plane in the sky, it would be one of ours uh, uh, during D-Day. Then the other thing they had to deal with was uh, anti-aircraft fire, anti-aircraft fire. Uh, the Germans had these flak guns. Flak was the abbreviation for the German word for aircraft defense cannon, which were uh, deadly weapons. They could fire 20 shells a minute, and they were calibrated uh, to ex these shells were calibrated to explode at the same altitude that those bomber formations were flying. And these shells were filled with all different shapes and sizes of razor sharp metal that could easily penetrate the thin aluminum skin of these bombers. That skin was so thin that you could take a screwdriver and just poke it right through it. And uh, they started their bomb run at a pre designated point called the IP or initial point, about uh, 50 miles from the target. And on their bombing mission, they just had to fly straight and couldn't take any evasive action. So they just had to fly in these killing fields of flak that were exploding all over. And if, if one hit a plane directly, it would just basically explode and disintegrate into thin air. If it hit, knocked the wing off, the plane would just drop like a stone. My dad said on those bombing runs, he's, even though it was so cold on those missions, he was sweating profusely and be dripping wet from the adrenaline running through his body. So I can't imagine what uh, that must have been like. So that, uh, and then after they finished their bombing run, if they made it through the bomb run, they tried to form back up again and then head back to England where once again they'd be hit by German fighters. So it was, uh, and then coming back to England, a lot of times these planes uh, you know, were damaged. They, they had to land at other bases or the weather was bad when they got back to England. They'd have to try to land at some other base through the fog. And so you had, again, uh, crashes uh, on landing. So it, it was a brutal undertaking, flying combat. Uh, at, uh, you know, what those guys went through, uh, I, I, just can't, I just can't imagine. After all, these guys are just in their late uh, teens and early 20s, just, just the young guys. My dad, though, was an old man. He was 28 years old, so uh, he was one of the old guys. <laughs> well, that's amazing. What's also amazing um, about what you just said about him being the old guy, not so much about him, but the younger guys, I mean, how did they get the experience and the, you know, suddenly you're called up for war, whatever job it is, it doesn't matter which one, but in this this case, a very, well, yeah, a very important, but a very dangerous job. How do they train them that quickly? Uh, you probably don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking aloud here. How do they get trained that quickly to do what they do? And then, like some of them, they're 95, 90 years of age at the moment. And, you know, they can tell you loads of stories, but it's the training that's important. And they obviously must have been trained very well to act so good. Well, uh, as you mentioned, the book does go through, uh, like, pilot training. A lot of people find that uh, interesting to see how they, they were trained. And uh, they did get some good training, but it really wasn't uh, all that extensive. Uh, a lot of the training was done after they got to England, especially formation flying, because that was uh, difficult. They fly in these very tight formations, you know, almost wingtip to wingtip. Uh, so those pilots had to stay alert at all times or else they'd clip a wing uh, on a plane next to them or run into the plane in front of them and, and, and they'd go down. But a lot of it was just on-the-job uh, training. And they, they especially like these gunners, you know, <laughs> uh, and as you mentioned, these young guys, uh, back then the world was a lot different. It was a lot different than the U.S. And now most people live in cities, metropolitan areas along the coast. But back then uh, the U.S. was very rural. You know, the majority of the people lived uh, in rural areas on, on farms. And a lot of these young guys had never even been out of their uh, hometown or home, co home counties. Like you mentioned, they were all of a sudden they're halfway around the world uh, and, you know, fighting a, fighting a war. Now, can you imagine today, like, handing, like, a, a brand-new plane 
you know, like back then a, a B-17 or a B-24 to a 20-year-old kid, and, you know, and back then I forget, I forget how much those planes probably cost a half a million dollars or something back there, but just handing, you know, like state-of-the-art planes back then to some 20-year-old kid and say, you know, here you fly it. It, uh, it, it was, it was pretty, pretty amazing. You know, for a lot of these guys, these young guys, these U.S. guys, it was the first time they had been away from home. So they don't have their mom, you know, or their 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 pastor or their peers looking over them, and all of a sudden they can, all of a sudden they're they're in England, they can do anything they want, you know. They got access to to girls and booze and cigarettes, and so it uh, that that was uh, that's why I say it was the defining moment of these guys' lives and something that uh, really was eye opening. It sounds like good all the, all the booze, the um, the women, and but you know, the, the bit that gets me, even if somebody told them over a period of weeks they got the best training, how did they navigate in them days? Because they didn't have the sophisticated radars that we have now. It's more they've got to look at a, a visual map and say, well, that is where the airport is. That is where that building is. This is where. You know, I mean, that must be 10 times difficult. Oh, yeah. Well, the navigators are probably the smartest guys on, on the crew because they had, you know, they did a lot of dead reckoning. You know, they had sextants. And, uh, yeah, that uh, that was pretty tough to navigate. Uh, back then, you had to just dead reckon, you know, look at the ground, objects on the ground, if you could see them because of the, the cloud cover. Because those those navigators, they needed to know where they were and where they were going. And a lot of guys got lost. A lot of planes got lost. And if you got lost from the formation, you were a dead duck because those German fighters would just pick you off like that. So it it it, it was tough on these guys. You know, a lot a lot of uh, people assume that a a crew they flew all their missions together, but that wasn't the case at all. Uh, my dad and his entire crew only threw two two missions fully intact with all 10 guys flying in the same crew because you had guys getting sick all the time with that wet, damp English weather, getting the flu, getting pneumonia, and then guys would get injured. Uh, and so you had replacement uh, crewmen all the time on, on these crews. And... They didn't fly the same planes all the time, too. My dad flew five different uh, planes uh, on his missions over there because they'd get beat up or they'd they'd, they'd train. A lot of people assume that they flew the same bomber all the time, too, which uh, wasn't the case at all. It's just a fascinating fascinating subject, uh, what these guys uh, endured. And like you mentioned earlier, you know, and these guys knew that their next mission could well be their last. And a lot of guys got flat happy and uh, got, uh, you know, what uh, PTSD, what we call today, because uh, it was pretty nerve wracking. And it was, it was very unusual, you know, un- unlike the infantry or the, the Navy or something like this, these guys could be, you know, over the skies of Europe, you know, risking their life getting attacked by German fighters and uh, uh, anti-aircraft fires bursting all around them. And then that evening being in London, you know, partying and drinking and, you know, chasing girls. So that, that was very unusual. You know, they, they were risking their lives. So when they got back to England, uh, they hit the pubs and uh, hit London when they could. Mm. I, I did have a little... I did share this in the book review clubs today and there was a little comment just now. Um, Somebody, I don't know his name, um, he's not really made it very clear, but anyway, he says, because Howard Snyder was the last man to bail out of the plane, um, because he came down about 10 miles further west than the rest of the crew, was this the reason um, obviously he survived? And he got away with, um, you know, being captured, or was it just very lucky that the Belgians were there to help? Well, he was the last one out of the plane because he was the first pilot, and as such, the commander of the ship and of the crew. Um, 
he came down in Belgium, and the plane came down in Belgium, but the other crewmen that were able to bail out actually came down in France. Now, this, this was right at the, at the border. And, you know, it was, just, it was just circumstances because some of the crew uh, who, who bailed out, they did get picked up immediately by the Germans, and they became POWs, and that's a story in itself in the book. And then uh, and everyone was injured on the plane. Uh, besides, the two guys were killed, obviously, but uh, all the guys that bailed out had some uh, had w- wounds of some sort, some very serious, some not so serious. And uh, it, it, I don't know, it was just, you could call it the luck of the draw or uh, God's will or, or, or fate or what have you on the you know, who escaped and uh, who evaded and who got captured and who got killed and who made it back. Uh, that's one of the things that uh, makes this, the, the story of this crew quite a unique because pretty much everything that could happen to a bomber crew happened to one of these, one of these guys. But just fortunate for my dad that he was, you know, some Belgians got to him first. And, and hit him before they could be picked up by the Germans. He's very lucky. Um, I do love them war films where the Belgians and the Polish, in particular, and some of the French as well. You know, they're hiding the, uh, you know, the, the like the like your dad. They would hide him. Is it the Allies or the natives? Um, anyway, they hide the good guys, don't they? And it, it's really humble to see all that. You know, because it was a war after all, and they they didn't have to risk their own life to help others, but they did, and they didn't do it because of any duty but humanity. They just thought, I understand, you know, you're one of us. They're going to kill you otherwise. Let's go, you know. And, and some of these films are very, very, very um, touching. So I, I just wish. Yeah, I just wish, it'd be, you know, I've always loved to meet these kind of people. I've met, I've met loads of people from my radio shows, but I never meet your dad, obviously. But, it's, you yeah, know, it's, it's just amazing. My heart goes out to him. Yeah. May he rest in peace. And, and even the gentleman in Germany, you know, he was only doing the job when he shot dad down. You know, hope he'll have many years you know, from now to, you know, meet you and and other people that shared the same experience. Yeah, the, uh, as I mentioned, I've been to Belgium uh, six times, and the Belgian people are wonderful people. Uh, Also, I've met a lot of uh, uh, Dutch uh, people from the Netherlands, and to this day, they just... They are still so thankful and so grateful for the Allies coming to their rescue and uh, re- uh, liberating them from Nazi oppression. And they do a great job of educating the younger generations too to remember as well. They're, they're, they're wonderful people. I made some. I have some. Made some dear lifelong friends uh, in both the Netherlands and, and Belgium. I hope you'll meet some more in Fairley when you visit England. Yeah, I have a lot of. Uh, I have a lot of friends, UK <laughs> friends, so I'm looking forward to meeting up with them on your know, Facebook friends. Yeah, especially the little pubs, because that's where over in England, um, I live in Scotland, but in England, that is where you meet people from the, the wars and the industries that, that used to, you know, like the steelworks. You know, you'll meet some interesting people in the local uh, country pubs that do the handful beer. You know, the yeah. Cascales, um, yeah. And they've always got a good American or Scotch whiskey there. <laughs> yeah, actually, the, the the pub that my dad and the other officers uh, went to the night before they were shot down called the Falcon in Bledsoe uh, there in Bedfordshire. It's still there. And uh, I've gone in there and had a couple pints. So then I'm going back in uh, August to have a few more. Wow. Um well, we are come to the end, end end of this section. We could go on, but I think why don't you just sum it all up and you know do come back again when you've 
been to England and um, or we can do another show very soon. Give all the websites out where people can get in contact or buy the book. Uh, well, to buy the book uh, in the UK, uh, probably either go on to Amazon UK or there's another website called Book Depository uh, that offers a good discount and free uh, worldwide delivery. You can pay in any currency, uh, whether it's pounds or euros uh, or what have you. And then, again, my website is stevesnyderauthor.com. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be on the show. Uh, my little tagline, it's our duty to remember. You know, the World War II is fading in the memory of most people because it's been so long ago, but we can never forget the sacrifice of those young, brave young men who fought and died for freedom so many years ago. They are the greatest generation. And, you know, like I, was, I keep saying about the films, they make the best war films ever because of what they went went through um, back in them days. World War One as well, um, but more in particular World War Two, because my mum remembers that, you know, she, she died recently, but it had a, a, a big impact on her, though, like I said, and others, uh, because of the, the Nazi Germans. I, I mean, I'm, I'm only calling them Nazi Germans because the the others... You know, everywhere you, you, you look, it's Nazi Germany. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the same as... Um, how, do you, how do you explain it in a different way? Um, the Californian-Americans, you know, <laughs> as an example. Um, or is it, you know... <laughs> see, Germany's a country. What made some of them Nazi Germans? Are they the bad people? Um, but because a lot of Germany and a lot of Germans are very good, even back in the days of the war. So it's the Nazi Germans that yeah. love people. Yeah, yeah. All the Germans, all the Germans were Nazis. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was a political party, the Socialist Party, and uh, so you know, a, a lot of the, the the men who fought in the military, you know, were not Nazis. Uh, the Wehrmacht, uh, the regular army, you know, was probably a few of those guys were Nazis. Uh, the SS arm, the arm, uh, the Waffen SS, which is the armed forces of the SS, those were the bad guys. Those were the real bad guys. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've heard about that before, and the Levensborn program comes to mind at the moment. <laughs> yeah, the, the SS were the guys that ran the, yeah. con- the uh, extermination camps, and you know, the Gestapo was part of the SS, and you know, the, the SS were the real hardcore, uh, ruthless Nazis. You know, they got you know, most of the guys that fought in the uh, the Wehrmacht, the Army, or the the Luftwaffe were were not, uh, not actually Nazis. No, I, I guess you know we're not going into religion, but. It's the same with the Jews, you know, they get called all bad things, but really it's not the, the Jew Jews, it's the people pretend they're Jews, is the it? But anyway, that, that's by the by. We had a great show, and I'll just cut us off here, um, and, and then I'll have a little chat with you. Thanks for listening to Freedom Talk Radio. Uh, co. UK. Welcome to Freedom Talk Radio, where your host, Andy Peacher, 